well, here's my presentation, so let's get to it. Um, quite a, just a very quick outline, I'll just talk about the background and motivation for those who are not familiar with the project. Uh, we we'll talk about how I developed tools to work with point clouds and why I had to develop them. And then we'll discuss specifically uh, point clouds as a representative as well as a performative format for landscape architecture. So now, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the Chilwung River, it's a river that runs uh, through three major cities in West Java, Indonesia, Bogor, Depok, and of course, uh, the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta itself. And just from the photographs alone, you can tell that as the river goes along is uh, 120 kilometers through these cities, the water gets um, degraded, the, the river is constantly being abused. And uh, on the right, you see that uh, people are, are still using it for livelihood, but instead of, of fishermen fishing for fish, these are fishermen fishing for plastic bottles that float down the river. Um, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of issues with the river, but the, the salient one, or rather the most pressing one, and maybe the most politically charged one is that issue of flooding. So these are photographs taken um, after the floods. We can't go into the floods because if you look at that stain line on that wall there, that is how high the flood uh, reached. So basically, everybody's first floor, sometimes their second floor gets flooded. And it's, of course, costing them a lot of money. Uh, the 2031 is estimated to have cost Indonesia $3.2 billion. And if you read the news, uh, flooding is not, of course, isolated to Indonesia. Singapore has it, or has it. In the Asia and Pacific region alone, $16 billion uh, just in 2014. Of course, this issue of flooding has not gone unnoticed. There are uh, what I call infrastructural knee-jerk responses, if you can call them that. Um, there are the dams which have been proposed a, more than a decade ago, since 2004, talks about it. And only in 2015, supposedly, um, some of the contracts were awarded. Uh, so that is one of the, the, the infrastructure responses. Another very huge and controversial one is the building of a, uh, of a seawall. So basically, um, trying to block off uh, sea level rise and try to save the city from sinking. Uh, more obviously, if you go onto the ground, is this issue of normalization, which is, in fact, kind of like a canalization of the river itself. Uh, it's an ongoing process. You'll see more images about it later. Uh, sometimes we question why they do it, because on the bottom right image, there is already a canal, which they are now re-canalizing to make it smaller, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive. So, um, like yesterday, we are part of a team. Uh, that's kind of the great thing about being in FCL. Uh, we are part of a team that includes engineers, uh, planners, as well as landscape architects. And our main goal is to find not really a solution. It's impossible to find a solution uh, just from the, the 10 of us. Um, but rather to start to, to think about whether there could be a change in the response that we take when trying to solve some of these issues. So instead of jumping straight ahead into engineering uh, solutions, could there be a, a slightly softer approach? Uh, and this is, of course, backed by the engineers in the team. It's not just the landscape architects wanting more green. Now, from the onset of the, the project, there has always been an issue with data. And a lot of the times, our researchers had to literally risk life and limb to collect the data. Um, just to give you an example, on the bottom right, to collect uh, hydrological data, we literally went to the dam operator's house, asked him, could I have your data? He said, yes. He'll photocopy 10 decades, I don't know, sorry, a decade worth of uh, data for us. And then we had to go and uh, make it into, type it into Excel one by one. And of course, for landscape architects, we need vegetation, which is sorely missing. We need topography, which is completely contradictory as well as uh, uh, completely unusable because the river basically goes up a mountain. So what um, we did, we partnered with the Institute of Technology in Bandung. They were very kind in assisting us in um, getting uh, a third party to actually fly the drones for us. As well as the simulation platform here at FCL, we were able to create, or rather capture, uh, very high resolution data of some of the sites that we had. So on the right, you see one of the results of this. This is a, a high resolution auto photo of it, of the site about uh, 20 centimeter per pixel resolution. But 
if you had already guessed, I'm not after two-dimensional images. I'm after three-dimensional point clouds. So these are, uh, this is a fly-through of, or rather fly-over of the, the three sites that we documented using the UAV. And you see, it's actually not a continuous surface. You see it's starting to break up where the points are not enough to cover vertical surfaces. And this is uh, quite a, um, a difference in terms of how we actually start collecting data. And you can collect them at any scale. You can collect them at the entire catchment scale, which is really, really large, uh, using satellites instead. You can capture them at the river corridor scale, or like what we've just seen using a UAV at the site scale. You could, in fact, have a million points just covering a single doorknob if you so desire. And all of these can be nested within the same three-dimensional environment. Now, this is something that is very different from what we are used to as landscape architects. If you had wanted to work with a three-dimensional model, you would have started something like this. Started with a base map, contour maps, adding on um, building outlines, footprints, extracting them, and so on and so forth. Now, on a silver platter, you're given something as detailed as that. Of course, with that detail comes a bit of um, problems that we will discuss about later. So now that we understand that the starting point is this high-resolution, three-dimensional point cloud data, my hypothesis, I won't read through the whole thing, is essentially to try to use it as a simultaneously as a representative and performative format. Why am I doing this? Firstly, if you were to do landscape representations, that would generally be one by itself. And if you were to do performance testing, that's another school of thought. Usually you had to jump through hoops. You had to convert from one format to another. If you wanted to try, for example, a landscape perspective, if you wanted to run a flood simulation through that, it is impossible, right? So in order to, to, to do something that is embedded um, the hypothesis at that point of time, that point be one of these formats that would allow you to do this. Now, before I even begin trying to understand whether it is uh, beneficial to go towards such a workflow, the problem was that there are, although there are tools to work with point clouds, they are scattered across many, many different platforms. ArcGIS has some, you have some from Bentley, you have some from Autodesk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I needed something that would kind of uh, firstly be usable for designers, and secondly, be something that would, would allow me to kind of manipulate the tools or even create the tools myself. So what I use, ended up working with is Rhinoceros. It is not a GIS program. It is a three-dimensional uh, modeling software. The good thing about it is that it already has a native point cloud object in which you can start working with, uh, as well as it has a, a quite a, well, not really powerful, but quite a user-friendly uh, plugin called Grasshopper, which allows you to do uh, simple programming without any knowledge in programming itself. So what I created was 28 tools that you see little icons up there, uh, categorized into three broad categories. So First category is the modification tools. These are basically the bread and butter tools that you need to start working with the, the point cloud data. Incision, you can cut it out. You can uh, copy. In this case, it's a copy and paste job from somewhere else. And why this is particularly good in point clouds is that you must understand the point clouds exist as individual discrete elements. So there is no connecting tissue. So when you remove one point, the surrounding tissues do not disintegrate like a mesh or a, or a surface model. In fact, the texture also is, is, is still completely intact when you start doing something like that. Now, what is novel about uh, my approach is that while other disciplines use this a lot to document the site, to analyze the S, is I wanted to inject something that is completely new, inject uh, a design scenario, for example. So, and that's what designers do. I mean, there's no point in designers not designing anything. So in order to put in a uh, scenario as a point cloud, I had to kind of jump through loops. The first is you have to, of course, model it. And you can't model directly in points. You have to model it in surface models. You to convert them into point clouds, which you can then texture to make it uh, visually at least look a little bit similar to the original base data that you have around it. Now, the reason why I'm sticking or trying to stick within point clouds is not only because I want to visually fit it to the base data. Uh, I also want to, like I said, connect it to 
some kind of a performance uh, or analytical model. I'll talk about the two that I use later. This one you see, of course, is a hydraulic model that we, uh, we use with the help of our engineering team. So now, with the help of these tools that I, that I kind of developed, I can start exploring a lot more options. So now it's not about whether or not you can do it, it's about, okay, now I can do it, what are the benefits or the pros and cons? So firstly, of course, is the, um, the enabling of scenario development. In this case, I uh, pushed in the, the government's uh, normalization, basically the canal. I put the, the canal into the, the model itself. Uh, like I said, you can do flood simulations. Uh, and I can start separating the point clouds. Of course, when you look at the point clouds just now that fly over, you can see, you can understand a tree from a building from the road. But to the computer, all of that is just the same thing. It's just a point and some color information. Uh, of course, there are much more advanced algorithms that will allow you to do this. But for now, what I am able to do with the tools that I had was to start separating uh, that into at least basic classification. So urban, uh, vegetation, water, as well as uh, the strata in which they exist in. So low vegetation, high vegetation, medium vegetation, and so on and so forth. So you put all of that together, you start having uh, something like this. You are able to uh, start with the existing site, create your, your scenario, test it out, visualize it in, in this manner, as well as to uh, prepare it for further analysis. Now, the problem, of course, is when you start comparing, uh, if you are looking at it as a form of realistic representation, I will tell you that with the two have, it is a terrible, terrible way to go. Um, simply because there's no way to light it. It's very hard to, it's very hard to texture it. Um, as compared to existing tools which have been developed over the, the past many, many years, uh, see, in this case, Cinema 4D with uh, Photoshop, with you know, lighting effects, with Loudworks, which is a, a tree modeling software. So if that was what you're after, then um, uh, it's essentially that I don't believe that um, uh, point clouds as a representative format per se is going to be of much use. But I think it's premature to kind of uh, completely throw it out of the water because a lot of the representational formats that I'm comparing it with exists in two-dimensional media, you know, on screen, in print, as sections, plans, elevations, and so on and so forth. But the value of the point cloud is such that it exists in three-dimensional media. So how do you then bring out that three-dimensional quality? I experimented with two, um, two options. One of them was digital fabrication. You take your reality captured model, make it into a mesh, and then literally mill up everything that is there. Uh, again, if you compare something that was done manually, that looks, you can understand where the pieces are. On the right, you can't see anything at all. It kind of is like a Swiss cheese kind of model. It's the exact same model that's one that's lying outside now. Of course, you must understand this, this took many, many weeks to create. And on top of that, it's missing a lot of in, important information, such as the, where the And of course, the pieces are all estimated. Whereas on the right is directly captured from uh, reality itself. And this lens useful in an exhibition kind of setting in which we uh, in which you use a projector information onto the model and because it was reality captured and because all the other simulations and analysis were done using the same uh, same data at the start all of this will then be projected perfectly onto the model itself so in this case you see a quite a preliminary flood simulation that goes on um, over the, the the village itself and this has been exhibited in Rotterdam, Zurich, Jakarta, of course, and in Singapore multiple times. Now, instead of trying to, so that was trying to, trying to bring the digital world into the physical world. So now we try to reverse it. We, we try to bring the physical person into the digital world. So in this case, uh, for those geeks out there, you will know what this is. We are wearing an Oculus Rift, which is a virtual reality head-mounted display. And you can, of course, if you can uh, take the nausea, headaches, and um, kind of motion sickness, you can actually fly over the, the landscape like Superman. It looks nothing like on a screen because you can start picking out 
details in the topography much more readily. You could see where the, the banks start to you know, become a 90 degree instead of something that's smooth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I didn't go too far with this because I kind of ran out of time. Um, but I think this is another possibility that would, well, more, more, uh, more likely benefit of the three-dimensional nature of the point cloud. So now that was for representation, now for as a performative format. So I did two uh, kinds of analysis. The first was, like I mentioned, with the help of hydraulic engineers, uh, the, the use of flood simulations. The second was something that uh, I found it to be possible. Yes, I can do it. Um, was the use of frag stats, which is a software to calculate landscape metrics. So landscape metrics, what, we, what it's used for is specifically to quantify landscape structure. So for example, how connected the, um, the urban fabric is or how connected the vegetated patches are. And I was trying to, because there is, uh, uh, there's a current kind of a lack of the ability of landscape metrics to kind of tie in together with the dynamics of the environment, I was trying to see whether you could actually link the two together. So is there a correlation between what we get from the, uh, the flood models and what we get from the metrics itself? So like I mentioned, the tools were created specifically so that designers could use them. And these are actually students' works. Uh, we gave them the tools, we gave them a short workshop, and then they went along and created their own scenarios. Some scenarios work better than others. For, for example, this one in the middle here completely failed. Because, uh, we weren't sure why until we realized that they, they didn't do any grading at all. So they changed the landscape, but everything was flat. So of course, uh, the, the model would fail. And the ones at the bottom look as if they can contain the flood. But if you were to dig deeper, you will understand that they are basically obliterating everything that is there, digging a five-meter hole uh, into the ground and then trying, of, trying to kind of salvage the situation in terms of the flooding. Of course, anyone that has uh, worked on floods will know that it is impossible to solve flooding at an isolated point, especially one that is um, downstream. So instead of a design-based approach, we went to a decision-based approach. So we, we zoomed out. We looked at, instead of a, a small section, we looked at a 40-kilometer stretch instead. And then we put in things that we thought were most likely going to happen. So first, of course, there's the original scenario. But there's also, if you look at the section, a full normalization scenario, which is basically the canal, the canal running the entire 40 kilometers of the stretch. Something that I think uh, is more representative of what will happen, which is a partial normalization, in which sections of it start to get normalized. And then, of course, our dream is that uh, instead of using any of those infrastructural things, we start to use green infrastructure instead. So we have retention basins. We have areas in which vegetation is allowed to slow the water down um, uh, in an attempt to try to mitigate the floods. So let's look at the, this. So in terms of uh, it ex is extend the full normalization scenario is, of course, uh, the entire stretch. And this is not something that is uh, plucked out from fantasy. We actually use sections that they drew. And then we embedded it in, I think, 400 over different sections and then it interpolated across the entire, section, uh, the entire river. The partial normalization, like I mentioned, uh, is the same thing, but a lot a lot less uh, extensive. And then, of course, the green infrastructure scenario is the one where we kind of scatter little um, elements across the entire stretch. So this map on the left is a probability of inundation map, which the, our engineers did. And if it's actually a very dangerous map for us to show to, to stakeholders, because if you were to take this map, um, as the only result that you have, and if your only concern is the flood, you will go with the full canal because it is the one that will solve the floods. And we know it will solve the floods because that section, that cross section, was designed specifically to hold that amount of water. So theoretically, it should work, and based on the simulation, it does uh, at least most of the time work. The other two work to a certain extent. Um, so the retention basins flood like they are supposed to, the expansion areas flood like they are supposed to, but the downtown area still has a little bit of, uh, a little bit of flooding. Now, uh, this is when the uh, engineers have to come in and kind of uh, let us understand the graph a bit. So the full normalization scenario, the problem with it is 
we already know, of course, uh, through experience from, from other canals, that the flood is going to come harder, it's going to come faster, and it's going to hit downstream a lot faster. And downstream is uh, central Jakarta. So not only is that going to happen, it's going to have uh, a lot more erosive power. Water is going to come in faster, harder. It's going to erode uh, the banks a lot harder. So uh, we don't think that's the right way to go about it. Um, we also have another two scenarios. Uh, one I call the urban scenario, and the other one is the vegetative scenario. These, nothing was changed in terms of the bathymetry of the river. The, the topography is entirely the same. The only thing that changed was the amount of riparian vegetation. I did this as a control to see how sensitive the flood model was to changes in vegetation along the river itself. And unfortunately, uh, we could not see any difference at all. So even though I reduced the vegetation down to 30% uh, or I increased it, uh, it didn't look like there was much at all, which is a bit contrary to what we understand from other literature in that riparian vegetation does have a role to play in flood mitigation. So what I'm suspecting is that the flood model itself, at least the portion that controls how vegetation is uh, calculated, is not fully in um, the effects of vegetation. So for example, it doesn't account for uh, infiltration. So all it does is it accounts for friction. That's all. Uh, so well, that's as far as we could go with that. But the problem, of course, with that was that when I tried to correlate some of the landscape metrics back to that, it was impossible. So you could, I believe, completely change it into a vegetation, I mean like everywhere is vegetation, and then these numbers will be exactly the same as you see on, on, on screen. So that was a bit of a disappointment, but at least I know for a fact that it is definitely possible to run some kind of analysis, uh, this kind of analysis uh, on, the, um, on the models itself. Now, towards the end of last year when all our models, all our data was almost, almost in, we were contacted by an NGO, uh, Chilubung Medeka, so they were proposing, or they were counter-proposing some of the government's plans of relocation and uh, eviction. Uh, and they wanted our help to kind of um, help them along with the, the flood simulations. And of course, we, we tried to do that. So we got everything together. We made sure uh, the floods were as representative as possible, to the best of our knowledge. And then on 20th of August, this happened. Uh, or rather, after 20th of August, eventually this happened. Uh, and it looks a bit more like a war zone now than anything else. Uh, the government came in, bulldozed everybody that was within, I think, about a 25 meter radius from the, um, the river. And if your house uh, happened to lie halfway between the 25 meters, they would cut a section through your house. And uh, eventually, it became an antithesis to whatever we wanted to do. We now have a river that is lined with concrete. We have riparian vegetation that is now relegated to living in tires. And we have residents that are living still next to the river, but even more distant from the river than they ever were uh, before. So at this point in time, I think it was a little bit like the final nail in the coffin for us. We had been battling this for a good, I think, four or five years. And um, it was at this time that we kind of decided that, OK, we need to stop. Uh, because we were running out of time, we were running out of money, and it became a little bit too sensitive to start talking about this anymore because uh, of the evictions that were happening. So then back to, again, um, the, the, the research itself. So how, what, what are the, um, the findings, at least? So as a representative format, well, firstly, there's going to be a, an issue with obtaining the data. We're to not talking only about technicalities in which, you know, like vertical surfaces disappear. But the use of UAVs is now going to be highly regulated. This, this was a flyer that was distributed to every single household in Singapore. Not just flyers. Every single household in Singapore received that flyer uh, instructing you about what you can and cannot do with uh, drones. Uh, for researchers in Singapore, you need a permit. Uh, this is something that is new and enforced in law. In Tokyo, anything above 250 grams, you run the risk of getting arrested. Uh, in the States, everything above 250 grams, they're trying to get registered. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's what they're trying to do. Um, and I already mentioned about the, the issue of trying to achieve realism in terms of a representative format. But I think 
if you're not after something that's realistic, I think this is a, quite a quick way to do it, and I'll, I'll explain a bit later, a little more later. Now, another problem um, with point clouds is that they have this strange ethereal nature to it. Um, the moment you, you want to, it's counterintuitive. I want to see something in more detail, I go closer, and then it just disappears. So everything that is close to you in the foreground dissipates, everything that is in the background is in focus. It's a little bit strange and uh, sometimes a bit uh, irritating when I, I'm trying to uh, make more sense of the, the data that I have. Uh, and it is extremely static in nature because it is almost like a three-dimensional photograph in that sense. Um, so there's no animation, at least in, in the work that I did. No animations, no, no people walking around, no atmosphere, no light. No way to cast light, even if you wanted to. Um, and of course, it is static in time, meaning that if something were to change, you would have to fly your drone again. And of course, that would entail more, uh, more cost and more time. But I think instead of trying to force point clouds into some of the existing formats that we have, so we have perspectives and sections and things like that, it should be dealt with completely differently. It is a different class on its own. It should be uh, studied as a completely different format on its own and not really compared with uh, other existing ones. Now, as a performative format, uh, there's, of course, difficulty in obtaining the data we saw. Uh, there's also a lot of difficulty in processing the data. A lot of this will likely not come from landscape architects. It will come from uh, computer scientists or engineers uh, in which they have to clean, filter, classify in order to start making sense of the data. And, um, the data that we have actually now is not really three-dimensional. It's more like two-and-a-half-dimensional because it exists in the grid. And what this means is that uh, we cannot have water flowing under bridges. We had to clear all physical bridges. We cannot have water flowing under canopy. And all analysis uh, with regards to that three-dimensional nature that you, you, might, you might think you need is not there. Of course, you can recode everything, but then everything becomes a lot more computationally expensive. And of course, there are errors, uh, both in the way I did the classification as well as some of the flood simulation. So from our high school geography, you know that the convex, convex bank of a river will have deposition. In this case, it has uh, erosion. Um, why this is so, is we're not really sure, and we, it was only brought up when I started to visualize some of these results. I mean, the engineers looked at the graph, the graph didn't say anything. But when we started to bring this out, it, it seemed to have some issues there. And of course, uh, when trying to relate some of these analysis back to design, if you could even understand what some um, that doesn't mean that you can design in a, in a fruitful manner, because numbers don't necessarily inform you of something that you might need. For example, spatial quality or aesthetics or things like that, or even uh, directly ecological uh, qualities. Um, of course, you can run other analysis. That's the whole point of, of uh, this exercise. But in this case, it was a little bit difficult. And in terms of the time it took, um, all along we have always wanted to have it like an iterative so you create a scenario, you get the results, and then you go back, and change certain elements, and then you run it again. This was never done. We always only had time to do one iteration, got the results, and then we ended it there. So a lot of the problems with that is because of the time it takes to firstly create the, the scenarios, test the scenarios, get the results back, etc., etc. And that loop was never finished. So now just to, to round off, um, what I see lies is firstly, baseline data or the collection of it will never be the same again. We are going to have much more accurate data uh, that you can either just collect, you know, just a few guys of us going out into the field, or governments are already, are already doing it. Singapore, I know uh, for a fact that it has done the entire Singapore in LIDAR. It's doing, by this year, it will finish majority of the roads in, in LIDAR. Um, and it's about time we start using um, using some of this information as well. And regardless of which format it is, point clouds will always exist in a table. You have your basic X, Y, Z, and then something that comes behind it. And it is in this table that I think uh, we need to be able to then embed custom metadata. 
meaning classification information, you have uh, maybe uh, some kind of a uh, solar radiation factor, if you have such a thing. And then all of it goes into uh, a table by itself. Of course, the problem is that that table can be billions and billions and billions of data entry points large, especially when you're talking about national data. And uh, there's research being done in computer science on how exactly do you manage this data? What are the, 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 the standards in which we need to be achieved in terms of point cloud data? But I think it's a, it's a good time in which we start to highlight to software developers, large software developers, that you know, there is a need for certain other tools to start coming together and using the point cloud data, not just, I mean, right now it's a lot of it's just measuring, you know, simple stuff like uh, I saw what uh, NPARCS was doing, uh, trying to see whether the, the vegetation was too low so that you need to go and trim the trees. Um, so a lot, I think there's a lot of, of value that needs to go in it, and I think we are at the, the starting point of uh, something that is going to be completely different from everything that we have known in terms of 2D GIS. So now we are moving into a completely three-dimensional world, and I think all these analysis and tools and, and all the things that we have been doing in two dimensions need to start to progress into this third dimension. And eventually when that all kind of comes together, I think this is where point clouds for landscape architects is going to be uh, the most useful in early stage testing. So we do it for, for buildings, why not for landscapes? Uh, so instead of, of um, uh, just blindly designing and basing it on, on aesthetics, why not test certain scenarios? Why not, you know, uh, have, of course, you could have other, other performance indicators as well and uh, running the loops eventually when you uh, get up to speed with it. And this all needs to start being inculcated in our young landscape architects, uh, not so much to replace whatever they know now, but to enhance it, to bring it to the next level. And for me, the next step, I will be joining uh, the National Parks Board in about uh, one and a half weeks time. And I'll be specifically looking at trying to use the LiDAR data that was collected by SLA, uh, specifically for urban ecology users. Uh, for design, I'm not sure because um, they didn't put me in the design group, but well, let's see. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you very much.